Interesting. So how does the common, because you, like we talked about, you're well educated, you have these degrees, right? How does a common person, a common man, who's in the trucking industry, maybe he owns a truck or, you know, they have a little bit of a knowledge of the business. How do they get into international trade, into global logistics? How do they make that pivot into doing what you do? So when you think international trade, think regulations, right? So that comes a little more. You have to understand the logistics before you can understand the law. Mm. So a, a trucker that's an owner operator or even a small 3PL or a small fleet owner, the opportunity is actually endless. It's just getting out of the comfort zone and being able to network. I do a great job kind of put, patting myself on the back or trying to bridge that gap. Uh, because people uh, are only used to dealing with their cultures and they get a little concerned about going outside of that. And I mean international cultures, global cultures. So the first step I tell people all the time is to network. You have to network and you have to not, you have to network fearlessly. You have to network hard, as hard as you go to get your authority, as hard as you go to become an owner operator or get your LLC, you got to go that hard in networking. Uh, so, and it, but it's not that difficult. It's associations, there's memberships. I list them all on my website so that people know where they can be members and associations so that way they can network. And even with COVID, they're having Zoom meetings. They had a whole Zoom Christmas parties for maritime associations. Okay. And there's, there's, they're everywhere. They're okay. not in a small place, they're, they're, especially where the major ports are. So I tell people all the time that the first step is to network, but then also to prepare yourself for the larger bulk freight as well. So I tell people after 9-11, the U.S. government put a lot of effort and resources into securing our borders. So they came up with an, a program called CTPAT. It stands for Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism. Okay. And it's a voluntary program, but I advise truckers to get it all the time because it, it tells, it, it represents your company as, hey, we are here to support your borders. How are you going to do international trade and global logistics if you're not joining the partnership to protect our borders against terrorism? Right, right. That seems so simplistic, right? Right, for sure. People make it harder than it has to be. And then you need to be available uh, to do port moves. There's customs territories within ports that you can move freight. Why are you not capitalizing on the mo those moves? Those same FTZs, the foreign trade zones and bonded warehouses, freight can be moved from there too. Why are you only focusing on the low board? Right. Uh, I think it just don't know. So I, I give list of associations one and memberships, and they're, they're not expensive. Some of them, some of them are free actually. Okay. Some are like two, three hundred dollars a year. And you just network within those groups. And they're making deals at the Christmas parties. Mm. They're making deals at the Christmas party. Like, who's going to move my freight at the Chinese New Year from New York Port? Right. And you're like, oh, I moved freight out of Ohio. If you're willing to now expand your network outside of what you are comfortable doing, the business is there. Right? Um, and every port is different. I tell people that. Don't think what worked for you in the New York Port or in Norfolk or in Long Beach is going to apply everywhere. Each port is different. So I tell people, focus on the area in which you actually have the equipment to support. Got you. Is there any special criteria that you need to have or you need to meet in order to even have these conversations with these people? It's knowledge. So terminology is a big key. Um, even in the course that I teach, I spend a huge amount of time just teaching terms. There's a dictionary of international trade. Hmm. I promise you. Look it up. It's on my website. Wow. It literally is a dictionary of international trade terms. Hmm. C can and you give us some examples of, right, of some of right. those? Uh, people think broker domestically, right? Freight broker. Okay. What is a freight broker internationally? An international freight forwarder. Right. What do they do? They're securing freight globally. What is an NVOCC? An NVOC is a non-vessel operating common carrier. What do they do? They buy space on aircrafts and on vessels long term. They'll buy the whole top deck. So what happens? There's no capacity. There's no space. So everybody's trying to get their cargo moved. What are you going to do? you got to call the NVOCC, who we would call the middleman. Right. Really? Right. So people don't even understand that that title exists and what their role is. People don't understand what's a licensed customs broker. They think it's the same broker that gets you freight. No, this person actually clears your freight into the country. If you don't have a relationship with a customs broker, you don't know what they're clearing. You don't know what to pick up. Right. 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 For sure. So it's, I mean, because I mean, it sounds awesome and it sounds like a big opportunity, but I just want to, I want to simplify it for people just so they really understand like what would be the first step or the first thing that they would do, because somebody listening to this is listening, they're like, wow, international trade, that sounds big, right? There's probably a lot of money in this. 
But the first step is probably, like you said, getting a hold of these lists and making these connections and making these calls and saying, right. hey, I'm a carrier. And I have this amount of... Literally go and join a membership. Okay. Without talking to anyone. Okay. Literally go on these websites and make yourself a member. There's the Society of International Affairs. They do all types of government contracts, but they're trainers. Okay. And they're just a network of people. Okay. Their membership is $300, I think, $300, $325 a year. Got you. There's the Atlanta Maritime Association right here in Atlanta. They, they are the ones that are discussing freight from Savannah, from Charleston, from Hartsville Jackson Airport. Mm. So the memberships is first. Okay. Because you have to just network. Okay. But those memberships come with a directory. They come with a membership directory. Just like that, you're going to know who's who in the game for your region. Got you. Then you want to go to the events. Even now during COVID, even if it means that you're doing Zoom events. Right. Right. Now your name becomes on the directory. Right. Now you can openly call this person and say, hey, I'm a member of the Atlanta Maritime Association just like you are. I'm interested in moving freight from Savannah. I just moved to Georgia. Oh, I have trucks in Georgia. Got you. Do and that starts the whole next level. Do they solicit these opportunities at all, or is it more so you have to go you find them? You need to be in these members. You need to be members. They're not just going to take random calls. Also, the relationships with international freight forwarders. So there's huge 3PLs that are also freight forwarders, like expediters, right? Mm. That's a big, huge company. They have a footprint in every major continent. And what are they doing? They're doing brokerage. They're actually brokering freight on the domestic side. They're clearing freight into the country. They're actually a freight forwarder. They're booking freight on oceans and aircrafts as well. Right. They're, they're members of these same associations. They come to these same conferences. Got you. In terms of like when you start getting into these circles and you start negotiating and you start trying to figure out like price and how do you charge, like that's a whole nother discussion. How do you figure that out? So I teach that too. And that's a little more complicated because uh, bidding for freight and doing uh, what we call RFQs and RFPs is very different international. So you have to have what's called uh, I'll say the basic terminology again. Okay. So there's letters of credit. A letters of credit is literally a document that goes to an international bank that guarantees your payment. I was on Clubhouse the other day with a woman that was in Indonesia asking the truckers one-on-one, -on -one, how do I get paid for three containers worth of product that I moved to, to Taiwan? Mm. And I was in the, in the in just listening, like, Who's, how are they going to answer her? Right. So I raised my hand to answer her, and I told her, your customer is not answering you that you sold this freight to because you have a letter of credit at an international bank. She's like, how, how do I know that? So your airway bill, your master bill of lading, just like your domestic bill of lading, is a legal binding contract internationally. The international bank that you're doing business with is listed on that airway bill. They're holding your money into the constantly confirms freight receipt that mm. isn't damaged. There's also INCO terms. INCO terms represents who's liable for freight in every mode of transportation. So if you, if you got a car, if you're shipping cars and it's on a vessel and the whole vessel blow up because the oil leaked from your car or something, who's responsible for that? Whatever's in your INCO terms is in your freight contract. So you have to learn. Uh, so there's no quick way to just say, I'm going to make some phone calls. I'm going to get into this membership. I would recommend people, you take the membership, uh, take the memberships, the networkers. You'll learn just by conversing. Right. Right. Sometimes terminology becomes easy just by having dialogue with people. And then I teach a course, of course, on it to help people understand the terminology. Then I do the introductions. I bring I bridge the gap from people that are on the 3PL side or that are only doing open hours or small fleets. And I introduce them to my network in other countries and see where they can somehow bridge the gap and what it is that they need. Got you. What, what type of margins are you able to make in this business? I mean, people are always interested in the money. Right. So like. Just, just an idea. I mean, obviously, every situation is going to be different. So, one, the difference is volume. Right. Right? So, right now, you're moving uh, box trucks or timber or whatever you're moving. Now, you got to start thinking that you actually can help move freight from 20 foot, 40 foot, and high cube containers from the port. Right. That's 1,800 metric tons worth of freight in most right. cases. Right? right. So, now you got a whole different weight class. So... You can actually do drayages. I tell people all the time there's a huge demand for draymen where literally go to the port and drop off freight at the rail. You want to be home with your family every day? Mm. People shy away from hazmat. Why? Right. Right. You know how much hazmat is sitting there? The Panama Canal went through a huge, for years, a huge um, controversy because the Panama Canal was so small that it could not fit larger ships, which is the uh, fastest way to get those large ships into the Port of Savannah in Charleston, right? So what did that mean for our economy locally here in Atlanta and in Charleston? We just was not 
even attractive in some global arenas to even take that freight. Mm. So what happened? There was a huge fight by the administrators right here to say, no, we're going to open up the Panama Canal because we want larger vessels to come here with freight. Gotcha. Because we're losing money right here in the city. It right. took years. The EPA got involved and said, what about the wildlife? What about fish and wildlife? Eventually it was passed, and it hasn't been that long. It's only been a couple of years. So major freight is now moving through, ha- through uh, Charleston and Savannah. A lot of it is hazmat. People shy away from hazmat. I don't know. I don't get it. I don't know why, because <laughs> even if you don't want to drive a truck that has hazardous material in there, what about your back office? Right. Have somebody in your office go get hazmat certified to just placard trucks mm. or sign dangerous good documents, and that's residual income. So when you talk margin, you got to think uh, capacity. And how much how much volume we're going to move. So if you have the cha- chassis, there's a huge shortage of chassis in this country. Huge, right, right. huge, huge. And chassis, of course, make you take a different weight class. Right. If you can move a different weight class, your volume increases. So I don't have a distinct number in margins. It's based on what type of equipment you possess or what your mar- what you have in your possession to capitalize on larger freight because if you don't have the right equipment to take 20 40 or a uh, high cube containers if you don't have chassis for uh that 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 uh that larger heavier freight then that's going to be a stump in your growth right uh but i think that the margin is endless actually as long as you are will- willing to roll with the tides quickly and get the um investment and the capital that you need to invest in your organization to be global it really it really is that simplistic 